Kaiser Wilhelm II, who reigned as the Emperor of Germany from 1888 until the end of the First World War in 1918, is often seen as one of the main instigators who helped bring about the war in 1914. But the Kaiser did not do this alone. The Kaiser was surrounded by a personal entourage of generals and advisors, nearly all of whom advocated for war, despite numerous attempts by other countries at negotiation. But how did the Kaiser, who had started his reign under the Iron Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, a man who had remade the balance of power in Europe and helped create one of the most modern and democratic governments in Europe at the time, end up being surrounded by generals and sycophants who would lead the German Empire to destruction? The answer can be partially found in a series of bizarre scandals years earlier, which included everything from misguided newspaper interviews to a Prussian general in a ballerina tutu. To begin, when Wilhelm inherited the German throne in 1888, it was clear from the start that his reign would be very different from that of his father and grandfather. Not content with sharing power with the German parliament or Reichstag under Bismarck, with himself as a mere figurehead, the Kaiser instead favoured direct personal rule by himself as a de facto absolute monarch. Wilhelm thus withdrew his support of Bismarck in 1890, and Bismarck was forced to resign as Chancellor. From then on, the Kaiser would only appoint chancellors who would be totally subordinate to him. Yet while the Kaiser could dismiss Bismarck, he could not sweep away the structures Bismarck had created. The Reichstag would remain an influential force that needed to be dealt with. And with the rising tide of socialism and demands for greater democracy at the beginning of the 20th century, Wilhelm would need help ruling his empire. The Kaiser had always felt insecure in his position, wanting to project an image of himself as Germany's confident leader, yet he was always troubled by Germany's uncertain place in the world, lacking a vast colonial empire and surrounded by imperial rivals. This, combined with his own personal deficiencies, as physically unimposing and with a withered left arm, meant the Kaiser was vulnerable to flattery. And it wouldn't be long before a group of people were able to use the Kaiser's weakness to gain access and influence over him. This group was known by some as the Kamaria, or alternatively, the Liebenberg Circle, named after the location of the personal mansion of Prince Philip Uhlenberg, leader of the circle. Philip Uhlenberg was Kaiser Wilhelm's closest companion, and even though he was only 12 years older than the Kaiser, he functioned as something of a father figure to him. Both men shared common interests, including romantic poetry, mysticism, and the occult, with Uhlenberg often meeting the Kaiser in social settings in the countryside rather than the political centre of Berlin. Historian Katja Hoyer explains this, saying Uhlenberg deftly created a feeling of emotional intimacy and genuine friendship that played into a yearning in the young Kaiser for the mentor he had never been able to find in his father or in Bismarck. Eventually, Uhlenberg was able to use his influence over the Kaiser to get his close friend Bernhard von Bülow appointed as the new German Chancellor in 1900, with many of Uhlenberg's relatives and friends also appointed to other government posts. And with that, the Kaiser and the German government were under Uhlenberg's influence and direction. For a few years, Uhlenberg and his allies would lead Germany to take a more assertive role in foreign affairs, with Chancellor Bülow famously saying, We do not want to put anyone else in our shadow, but we also demand our place in the sun. This quest for a place in the sun would lead Germany to challenge French domination of Morocco, with Bülow even threatening war over the issue. But when the British said they would support France, Germany would be forced to back down. This humiliation confirmed the Franco-British alliance and the First Moroccan Crisis, as it became known, would also begin a bizarre chain of events that would bring the Camarilla Circle crashing down. In 1907, a year after the crisis, a journalist called Maximilian Harden published a series of articles accusing the Kaiser and his inner circle of pacifist tendencies after backing down from war during the Moroccan Crisis. Harden then went even further, saying Uhlenberg, Bülow and their circle were secretly homosexuals seeking to bring Germany to ruin, and that they had covertly met with French diplomats during the Moroccan crisis and conspired against German interests. At this time, homosexuality was a crime in Germany and a very serious charge to make. Kaiser Wilhelm, anxious to not be tainted by association with such men, dismissed Uhlenberg and his associates and demanded the issue be settled in court. This, however, only made things worse, since what was essentially baseless accusations from a magazine was now drawn out into the open for all to see in court battles that would last for years. Although the Kaiser himself was not accused of being homosexual, 
the scandal still meant the Kaiser needed a new set of advisors. And in order to counter the perception created by the Uhlenberg scandal that the Kaiser was not manly enough and not aggressive enough in German foreign policy, the Kaiser surrounded himself with a new entourage comprised mostly of army generals, which meant that the Kaiser was now under the close influence of Prussian war hawks who thought of nothing but pursuing Germany's expansion through military means. The Kaiser's appointed Chancellor von Bülow would also fall from power months later, after his failure in the famous Daily Telegraph affair, where he failed to double-check the wording of a published interview the Kaiser had given to the English Daily Telegraph newspaper. The interview contained the infamous statement from the Kaiser saying the English were mad, mad, mad as March hares, a statement which greatly damaged the already strained relations between Germany and Great Britain. Bülow was on a holiday at the time the interview was submitted for approval, but he still bore responsibility for the fiasco and was forced to resign. His successor as Chancellor, Theobald von bethmann holweg was a much weaker man and crucially much more open to being swayed by the military. In quick succession, the Kaiser had lost his friend and mentor and his most competent man in the Reichstag. This greatly hurt both the Kaiser's confidence and his ability to govern effectively. Yet even though the Kaiser was now isolated, with no contact with either the Reichstag or his circle of civilian advisors, this was not the end of his troubles. There would be one final blow. Whilst the Kaiser was hosting a hunting party for his military friends, the general of the infantry, Dietrich von Hülsenhelse, thought he could lift the Kaiser's spirit by dressing up in a ballerina tutu and dancing around the room. The image of this prominent Prussian general dancing around greatly entertained the crowd and even made the Kaiser laugh for the first time in a long while. But then, suddenly, the general clutched at his heart and made a strained face before dropping down dead in front of the Kaiser. The general's heart attack was the worst thing that could possibly happen to the Kaiser. After accusations of having homosexuals in his inner circle and looking weak on the world stage, the Kaiser now had a dead general in a tutu on his hands. If this story got out to the press right after the Uhlenberg scandal, it could cause irreparable damage. The body was quickly hurried out and the tutu removed before the press could find out, but the Kaiser was deeply damaged and suffered a near nervous breakdown as a consequence. Anxious to avoid any more scandal, the Kaiser withdrew from public life and government business for months. This created a power vacuum which the new generals that surrounded the Kaiser were all too eager to fill. Thus, what had started as a quest by the Kaiser to assert his dominance over the German system had backfired immensely. The Kaiser had surrounded himself with flatterers and sycophants who, while supportive of him, had brought him nothing but scandals and public disapproval. And by weakening the institutions Bismarck had created and leaving nothing in its place but himself, the Kaiser had created the ideal conditions for the military to assert control once the Kaiser had been forced to retreat from public view to preserve his image. And so, while not nearly as famous as the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the Uhlenberg Affair and the other scandals before World War I still indirectly led to war, as they greatly weakened the German government and the Kaiser which meant that when war came in 1914, there was no one around the Kaiser to advocate for peace as the German Empire took its final steps to its own destruction. Maximilian von Harden, the man who had first accused Uhlenberg, even called the affair the biggest political mistake of his life. I hope you enjoyed this video and thanks for watching. If you'd like to see more from Newsreel History and help more content get made, please consider subscribing and I'll see you next time.